you might turn up here every Sunday morning with this at the forefront of your mind and you hear the likes of John standing up the front and telling you it's all sorted, it's all done and that is all true and you're going but halfway through the worship song you feel guilty or you come to take communion you feel guilty and you're coming to the communion table to be forgiven for the sin that you've been well long forgiven about I sat here with this and I said, Lord, why am I bringing this same message? It feels like the same message I brought two weeks ago. When I stood up here and, sorry, I am using this, and sat up here, oh, that's getting flexible, I am putting on weight. Sat up here, yeah, that, anyway, sat up here and said how you're forgiven because of this table, because of what Christ did. Yes? And I felt, God, well, why is this coming back again? Two weeks later, God said to me, because people haven't got it yet. They still haven't living in that reality yet. And I want my people to live in that reality. I want them to live out their daily lives knowing they are forgiven and forget, keep bringing the same thing back to me. Once for all. That's what Jesus Christ did for humanity when he died and rose again. Yet we Christians miss that point sometimes in our journey with him. Associate Pastor Warren points out the futility of us asking for forgiveness time and time again for the same sin we have committed, and we are to incite each other into love and good deeds. I'm actually going to open in the prayer reading from Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Lord, that just wraps up just about everything about you. And we give you praise and glory for that. As we look at your word, as we unpack it for ourselves, Lord, by your spirit, I pray we will pick up the fact that it's all true. What is being said to us as individuals and as your people collectively, it is all true. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'll read that verse again. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, which is what we remembered this morning in communion, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I'm angry. I am really, really angry. I found myself incredibly angry at the beginning of communion this morning. I found myself so angry, I nearly literally started hollering at all of us. Notice the phrase, all of us, including myself. Because of the lie that is in some of us about communion and about what Jesus did. And as we go through this, I hope you pick up that actually some of us are walking around with a lie sat in us about who we are in Christ and what Christ has actually done for his people. And I really am. I, you know when you get those moments, well, I don't, you may not get these moments. I get these moments sometimes, I sit there, I can feel it whooshing up. And I'm thinking, okay, is that me angry about something? I'm irritated at, say, maybe something John just did, which wasn't true. It's nothing to do with John. John was safe. Was it, I am irritated at that. Am I irritated because I'm slightly tired? Or is it I'm irritated? Or is there an, a genuine God built up anger going on? And I sat with God momentarily and I felt it was God saying, no, this is, this is, this is okay. This is not you. <laughs> this is me expressing something inside of you. So we're going to look at Hebrews 10, chapter 10. 
that verse I read to you is really the sort of argumentable verse that runs throughout the whole of Hebrews about who Jesus is and what he has done. But we're going to look at Hebrews 10. Context. Um, two weeks ago, I preached here. Do you remember that? Who remembers that? Two weeks ago, last week, I was at Baptist Assembly, sunny West Bromwich. They don't have an ocean there. Um, it's here two weeks ago. And who remembers the box? And I've titled it, Don't Box About. And it was about communion. It was about lots of things, about approaching Jesus. And halfway through that sermon, not in my notes, I found myself saying about spurring each other on. Do you remember that? You may, I threw away a line that you're meant to spur each other on. And sometimes you can do that in a good way. And sometimes in a spurring can mean something not quite nice. That verse has not left me for two weeks. So I then looked at chapter 10 with God and said, okay, you've not, this has not left me. Why not? And uh, let's hope we pick this up. So Hebrews. Now the letter to the Hebrews, author unknown. We actually don't know who the author is. But the letter is, appears to be to Jewish Christians suffering great persecution. They're suffering public disgrace for the name of Jesus. Which on one level is fine, but unfortunately they're starting to back away. They're starting to fall into the old Jewish rituals a little bit. They are quite rightly being fearful, but the fear is now making them compromise some of their faith. They're also starting to allow other religious beliefs to start watering down their strongly held beliefs as Christians. They're almost trying to make themselves probably slightly acceptable within the culture they're in, so they probably don't suffer persecution. I won't reflect on maybe how does that feel about today. We in this country do not suffer persecution, but we can sometimes try and water down our beliefs so we're a little bit more acceptable to society. I'll leave that resting. So, read with me. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. So the argument from this author is that he's trying to get to the point of explaining who Jesus is. And the sort of the climax sort of comes here in Hebrews 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could... Would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The law is only a shadow. As I said, these were Jews who had become Christians. They would have been Jews who would have followed Moses' law. I would have liked to say to the letter, but they would have known it. They would have, part of their sacrificing for their sins, as we know in Jewish times, was they would go to the temple. There would be yearly festivals. There would be just offering, and they would go and offer an animal, a bull, or a goat, or whatever is prescribed in the Old Testament. We're not going to look at it, but prescribed in the Old Testament. Now, how to gain purification, how to be cleansed, how to be forgiven by God, by Yahweh, for your sins. So you'd go up to the priest who's serving at the temple on that day, or the priest. You would give them the, their various bulls. They would sacrifice it, sprinkle the blood on the altar, and you would be forgiven. It would not be just done on an individual basis, but it was done on a corporate basis. There would be sort of the Day of Atonement where the sins of all Israel would be forgiven on one moment when the high priest lays his hands on the ball and gets sacrificed and killed. Do you get the point? Okay, so that's the point. Now, a lot of us know that, and we know that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. But what seemed to be happening here, they seemed to be falling back slightly because they were under persecution seem to be trying to fall back to the old rituals. And maybe also they were thinking, well, if we're suffering here, maybe we got this wrong. 
we're following this Jesus and we're getting lots of trouble. Maybe we've got this wrong. Maybe we need to take on some of the old Moses law. Maybe, maybe the sacrifice of Jesus just wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient. So the author here is making it very clear that actually these sacrifices of bulls and goats for guilt offerings were just a foreshadow, just giving you a taste, a pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. He makes it very clear that even though these rules were laid down by Yahweh, they weren't enough. They're not the real thing. They actually can't really forgive you for your sins. So I just want to make a, I just want to point out one verse, verse two to you. There's three words, three words in verse two. Once for all. That's the three words. Once for all. Can you repeat that after me? I want to make sure you're with me. Once for all. Once for all. I want to see if you can retain that in your mind. Once for all. If I can make an anagram out, that'd been useful. But no, once for all is good enough. Greek word means hapax, which literally means once done and dusted, signed, sealed, delivered, all over and done with. I've got a song in my head, I won't sing again. <laughs> signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours, but we, we, we won't go there. <laughs> Clearly two weeks ago, I'm done, I'm done, I do, I do, I did, I did. It's really traumatised all of you, hasn't it? Yes, that's clear. But it stuck in your head, didn't it? Good. But once for all, done, dusted. And in that verse 2, that does not mean that because it's, it's pointing out that actually if these sacrifices did what they were meant to have done, it would have been done once for all and it's not enough. And we're going to carry on. But I just want you to, once for all is to be ringing in your head. So in these first five, uh, four verses... The author is making it very clear that these performing, these priests who perform these sacrifices for the people had to do it again and again. And he said, but the problem was, in verse 3, these were just an annual reminder of the people's sin. Didn't actually do anything. They actually just reminded the people how rotten they were. That's all it did. Nobody saw us saw that anymore as sacrifice. And yes, we're forgiven and we're the people of Yahweh. It's actually, we're sinners. We're rotten. We need reminding of this on a constant basis. That's what that says. So, we're not going this bit by bit. We're doing sort of taking chunks and just unpacking it. So, verses 5 to 18. Therefore says the author. Those sacrifices aren't enough. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Repeat after me, once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. I think the author's trying to repeat something. He's really trying to get something into people. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, 
He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. Should be an amen. Amen. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, I always like the therefores in Bibles because everything that precedes that is trying to get to that moment that says, therefore, once you've got this sorted, therefore, this is the reason why. Therefore, if the bulls and the goats weren't enough and they were being done yearly, day in, day out, therefore, when Christ came, Christ, who, when quoting uh, from this psalm, the uh, inserted in the Hebrews, is actually meant to be sort of Jesus saying, you prepared a body for me, so I would be the ultimate sacrifice. And what I'm saying is, here I am. It's been interpreted as supposed, you know, applied to what Jesus did. This therefore, when Christ came, it was not just the ultimate, but the final sacrifice. That's the point. You said, but ultimate and final are the same. But sometimes we sort of hear what I think was going on. They were thinking, oh, he's the higher echelon, the ultimate Jesus. You couldn't get better than that. But we forget it was also the final one. There is no more to come. It is end of story. It is done and wrapped up there in Jesus. So no good going back to sacrificing bulls and goats. Because not was he just the ultimate, he was the final He was the once for all. And his argument is is that the priests are constantly having to bring the same, the same sacrifices again and again. Go through the same ritual, the same procedures, the same cleansing of themselves, washing themselves, putting on their robes every day taking on board all the various sacrifices, the animals, killing them, the blood. It wasn't very pleasant. He does it every day, but he wasn't doing anything. It literally must have just become a ritual. The heart wasn't in it. It was not enough. It was never enough. It was never going to be enough. That's the bizarre thing. If you can get your head around this, because I can't. It was never going to be enough until Jesus came. And I see us all nodding our heads and going, yes, Warren, we agree with you. Yes, we agree with you. But do you live your life out? This is what I get angry about. Because we'll sit here on a Sunday morning. It's what I found myself welling up in. Believing it here on a Sunday morning, but struggling to believe it once we've walked outside these doors. By the way, church is not here, it's out there. And we struggle to believe that out there. Let's just go back. Before that, therefore, that verse 2 again. It makes this statement... If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. So goats and bulls are sacrificed. People still feel guilty about their sins. So it wasn't enough, was it? Would we say that Jesus was the final ultimate and final sacrifice yep cool so how about us when we feel guilty about our sins what about where we sit there and read about these constant rituals of sacrifice over and over keep coming to the altar over and over again to sacrifice and it's not enough how about when we have brought something that we feel guilty about to the table or we've no we haven't even brought it to the table because the table's not about that and we'll come to that later when we bring it to the cross of Christ and say I am sorry and we say you are forgiven why do we bring it back again do you bring it back again 
Some of you are going, no, I've got it all sorted. I don't do that. But as some of us ritually bring back something to Christ, thinking we're still not forgiven. We've got to somehow be forgiven for this constantly. We bring it back almost like a ritual. You might turn up here every Sunday morning with this at the forefront of your mind and you hear the likes of John standing up the front and telling you it's all sorted, it's all done and that is all true and you're going but halfway through the worship song you feel guilty or you come to take communion you feel guilty and you're coming to the communion table to be forgiven for the sin that you've been well long forgiven about I sat here with this and I said, Lord, why am I bringing this same message? It feels like the same message I brought two weeks ago. When I stood up here and, sorry, I am using this, and sat up here. Oh, that's getting flexible. I aren't putting on weight. <laughs> sat up here. Yeah, that. Anyway, sat up here and said how you're forgiven because of this table. Because of what Christ did. Yes? And I felt, God, well, why is this coming back again? Two weeks later, God said to me, because people haven't got it yet. They still haven't living in that reality yet. And I want my people to live in that reality. I want them to live out their daily lives knowing they are forgiven and forget, keep bringing the same thing back to me. You can see it. It's coming up inside. And guess what? If you keep bringing it, you're never, it's never going to be enough. You've got to start accepting that you're forgiven. So what's the answer? Well, it's Jesus' sacrifice. It's not about us. It's what he's did. And so we're going to see if we can work around that. Now, I'm going to ask you to see if you can get your heads around that as we carry on. Getting your head around this. Okay. I'm not asking you to get your feelings around this because your feelings are a waste of time. Emotions are great and they're useful, but actually, until your head gets around this truth, your feelings take time to catch up. And the loss of the time, I think, for some of us, the problem is, is that our feelings override what our head knows. We read the truth in the Bible. We read that it said it's done once for all. It's all over and done with. And we know that up here. But somehow our feelings well up and override the truth. I think that's why it says in Romans uh, 12 that, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. No good renewing your heart. That has to catch up later. So whatever your heart is saying, if there's something now in your heart and a feeling that's saying you're guilty... Ignore that, please. Let your head start saying, no, according to the word of God, I'm innocent. Because of what Jesus did. I will put this in, because it's true. I don't want to be... Uh, I don't want to be accused of saying that you can just do whatever you please whenever you like it and not worry about it because that also equally is not true. It shows that later on in the letter. But this is what I want to say. You have to have a living relationship with Jesus. Now, excuse me, that does not mean that your whole relationship with Jesus has to every day, constantly, for every minute, constantly feel like it's on fire and it's so robust and so connected you're feeling okay. John made it very clear, actually. I, I, this morning... If you think we're connecting, it was interesting during the week. I was sitting there writing the sermon, knew exactly what God wanted me to do. And then John popped in to sort out the laptop. And I said, what's your stuff about today? And then he went, da 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 about communion, about how we're forgiven. And I went, ah, oh, that's interesting. Maybe God's trying to emphasize something. So if that's you this morning, listen to him, please. And I talk to myself in the mirror often as well. You have to have a, come to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour to be able to accept the forgiveness. You've had to come to that point at some point in your life that says, 
yes, you are my Lord and Savior. I recognize that you died on that cross for my sin and I'm committing my life to you. And normally here at the church, we see that as full submersion in ends in baptism and then the walk with Christ really begins, i.e. the toughness of it. Making decisions really easy, to be honest with you. It's then walking with Christ that's the best bit. So if you're not at that stage yet this morning, as you listen to these, understand the love of our God through Jesus Christ. I want to look at verse 12. Again, this author in verse 11 keeps talking about the, uh, the priest can talk, constantly repeating the same sacrifices. But, he says in verse 12, when this priest, who is Jesus, had offered all, for all time, note that, for all time, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So for for all time, one sacrifice, and now Jesus sits in power, sits in power equally alongside his father. Now, I'm not going to get into full um, Trinitarian theology with you. I am trying to hopefully my exam. I will pass that in weeks and a half time. Discuss it with me afterwards. Um, But he does sit in power. It's not like Jesus was just some sacrificial lamb. Oh, poor him. He was like the ball. He actually sits in power. The bulls and the goats don't sit in power. Jesus does. So he has control. That Hebrews 1 verse 3 that I read right at the beginning is the identifier of who Jesus is. He holds everything together by his word. So that means he holds the power of forgiveness as well. If he holds the keys to death and Hades, he holds everything. So when it's done once for all, it's done. Am I repeating this over and over again? Yes. Why? Because I think some of us are taking some time to get there. If you're saying yes, but not me, once for all, repeat after me. Repeat it again. Is anybody excluded in the all bit? Anybody in this room not part of the all? Okay. But verse 13 does make it clear that though it's once for all, there are time people who just won't accept it. Won't accept Jesus, won't accept what he's done. Because it says since that time, because Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God, He waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Now, sometimes we read that and think, uh, you might read that and think, oh, that means Satan, demons. Those are Jesus' enemies. Unfortunately, the understanding is also, it's those people who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There is a point that they have not bowed the knee to him. Effectively, they are classed as Jesus' enemies at the end of time. And that's what Jesus is waiting for. It's not what Jesus wants. It's not what God wants. Because he died once for... It's not what he wants. But you've got to accept him as your Lord and Saviour. He done the difficult bit. You get the easy bit. You just accept him. It's, It's actually easy. But some of us make it a big battle. I'm not good enough. Congratulations. No, you're not. That's why he died for you. I'm not good enough. Pastor David is not good enough. That's why Jesus died. Oh, I don't feel ready. You're never going to be ready. Get on and just accept it. And accept him. Sorry, this seems to be a real rant. Right, verse 14. He's waiting for his enemies to be his footstool because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now that's a really strange verse. For those who are good at their grammar, Auntie Joan, 
and then there's me, not. Because by one sacrifice, he has, has, past tense, yes? Please say yes. Yes, thank you. Has made perfect, perfect meaning complete, all done and dusted, nothing wrong with you, absolutely perfect. Forever, that's a mighty long time, those who are being, being, that's not past, that's not future, that's sort of, thank you very much, ongoing. So I'm I'm getting you included in this. It's an ongoing process of being made holy. So this is the point. It's already been done. You, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you're all perfect. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You're all perfect. Because it's already been done. So the end result, when you shed this mortal earthly body, you're perfect. You are currently being, today, made holy. So it doesn't mean that you live perfectly. Who gets it wrong? Who doesn't quite do everything that God wants them to do? What I love, there are some that are, yes, I'll hold my hand up. There are some that are going... And this is where the problem is. Because we do get it wrong. I get it wrong. Do make mistakes. Do screw up. Do not live the holy life. Do upset people. Don't mean to. Sometimes having a bad and off day does happen. I'm sorry. I'd like to live in the spirit on a permanent basis. But there are moments on my occasion I might suddenly have a whoopsie. But because I am know that I am perfect at the end... I don't live in my mistakes. I try not to. I know that I am on a journey of being made holy. You are on a journey of being made holy. It is from your errors, it is from your sins that you learn that it's part of the process. So you ask forgiveness for those, recognize you're forgiven, learn and ask the Holy Spirit to help you not commit it again, and you keep going. Now certain sins, some of us keep repeating. But part of what is the nice big word called sanctification, or being made holy, i.e. being made other, is sometimes you'll notice that that sin that maybe is one of your things that sits with you a lot, you might find that the gap between each episode gets longer. And slowly but surely, as you go on your walk and journey, it gets longer. That's sanctification at work. That's being made holy. But at the end, you're perfect already. It's all sorted. That's a lot in just one half of a verse, isn't it? We don't mind it being confusing grammar because it's not. Because by one sacrifice, he has made you perfect. He has made you, past tense. But you're in the current process of being made perfect. I just want to jump to verse 18. And where these have been forgiven, these sins... There is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Because Jesus has done it. The author's trying to wrap it up that it is once for all. Hapax is the Greek for that. Do you recognize that you are forgiven? The cross is the place where the sins were forgiven. The communion table was not. Communion table now for today is where you come and get the strength for the journey. It is not the place that you come to asking for forgiveness. That that happened up there. 
This is the place where we remember that. As John was quite rightly putting, and as at one point I thought he's nicking my sermon here. Um, the point is, is that in the Corinthians verses, etc., it talks about the fact that you do this in remembrance of me. We say on the table, this do in remembrance of me. Not this do in remembrance of your sins. Do this in remembrance of what I have done for you. I, I, I really think... God really wants to emphasize this for some reason. It's not what you've done wrong, it's what I've done for you. You individually, you corporately. So some of us come to this, and John was right. There are some people who go, oh, I can't take communion today. Screwed up during the week. Really sinned badly. Oh, man, I looked angrily at my neighbor. Or I, I've really been offensive to someone. Or, or whatever you want to think of. Or, oh gosh, do you know something? I didn't do that for that person. I should have been really nice to them. I didn't go the extra mile. Oh, I can't come and use communion now. Actually, that's the time you do come up here because you need strength for the journey. You don't worry about it. You just come and take it because you've been forgiven. Because it's what he's done, not what you haven't done. So, I hope you got it. Once for all, yes? You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Can you live in that reality? Because now we're going to move on in the passage. Because as John lovingly says sometimes, that's enough navel gazing. If you've not heard John say that before, it's a great time. Because that's a point we've looked at ourselves The passage now goes on to, from verse 19, therefore. Once you've got sorted, you are forgiven once and for all. There's a reason. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance and faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why do you need to know that Jesus has forgiven you? Why do you need to know that he was able to accomplish that no animal could? Why do we need to look at the perfecter and finisher for our faith? Why do we need to keep stop looking over our shoulders at what we've done wrong and keep looking forward? Well, because you're to spur one another on. You need to recognize you are forgiven because there is a confidence that you're going to enter the most holy place. The inner sanctuary says this quite clear through the body, which is Jesus, through the curtain, which then converted to his body. That's a reference to when Jesus died on the sacrifice, the curtain to the inner holy place was torn from top to bottom. The inner room. And I'm not trying to be derogatory, but how can we put this best? It's almost God's front room. Some people, the front room is their holy place. It's a place where you can come in and sit with God. Not in irreverence, but with reverence. But recognize you are welcome to come and sit and be. And you're welcome. Every day, every moment, all the time. It's God's house. You're welcome. You're welcome into the household of God through what Jesus did. And who are we this year? And every year, by the way, but specifically this year, we're what? Sorry, say that again, we're... (laughs) 
That means you're members of God's household. It means you're welcome all the time. When you enter your own house or home or flat or, or room or etc., do you feel welcome entering into your own home? Unless, of course, you've done something wrong. No, I've done something wrong. Joy's upset with me or something. I may not be quite welcome. But I'm joking, that never really happens. She's so pleased to see me all of the time. <laughs> Hello, darling. Um, Hi, honey, I'm home. Get out. No, no. That's never happened, ever. Um, I don't walk in going, hi, honey, I'm... No, no. <laughs> But you're welcome, and you laugh about it, but you walk into your own home, you know you're welcome. It's the same because of what Jesus did, you're welcome. He holds the keys, and you're welcome. You just come in. There's a point to this. Verse 22, and this is the bit, I just, I'm just trying to pick up. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Some of us read that sincere heart, meaning a pure heart, meaning I've got to be absolutely cleansed prior to approaching God. I must be cleaned, I must be washed, I must have scrubbed my heart. I must have pure thought all the time as I walk in now and enter and come into prayer. No, sincere to me is honest. Honest about where you're at. I come home, excuse, I know I'm not asking for your permission, dear, but I come home to Joy sometimes and she might say, how are you doing? And if I go, fine, sweetheart. Everything's wonderful and sunny and glorious. Nothing's gone wrong today. Everything's hunky-dory. I'm wonderful and I, I love everybody in the world and everything's great. She knows when I'm not being sincere. But I walk in and say, oh, I've had an awful day photocopy didn't work properly and I this is mine I'm not going to clearly talk about I've had an awful day but do you know what I mean if I walked in with that sense that I've not been honest about how the day has been I mean I don't tell Joy anything because I'm not allowed to as a pastor I keep things confidential but do you understand what I mean I've got to tell her I might not be feeling particularly happy right now definitely my old job that happened a lot I walk in and she could tell straight away I was in a foul frame of mind I go, no, it's fine. I don't want to talk. Everything's hunky-dory. An hour later, I'll explode because I've had a bad day. Approaching God with a sincere heart is actually approaching him in honesty. Not pretending, not hiding. He knows anyway, so you might as well be just sincere. You haven't got to pre-prepare yourself. Come into his room. If there's something he wants to point out to you that you need to ask for forgiveness for, he will point it out lovingly. Then you ask for forgiveness, but it's sincere. Because Jesus, as it says here, has sprinkled your hearts. He has, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. That's a whole reference to what the, you did in the temple worship. But he's saying here, Jesus does the sprinkling of your heart. He throws the cleansing blood by what he did at the cross of your heart. You haven't got to worry about that. You can't pre-prepare yourself. You ain't good enough. Jesus is. So, hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. And this is where we stop navel-gazing, this is where we look at each other. Because the whole point of being part of members of God's household is that when you know you're forgiven and you live in that reality, you spur each other on in that as well. And the word there for spur is incite. You incite people on to love and good deeds. Good deeds being what Jesus wants you to do. He's pre-prepared for you to do. But you've got to spur each other on. Incite each other on. Really get you revved up and going for it. And you're meant to do that to each other. Because you're a corporate body. You're part of members of God's household. You are to incite each other on. You don't just walk in here, do your worship on a Sunday morning and walk back out again. You incite each other. I mean, that's really vicious. I sat there and I thought, oh, spur. I normally think of cowboy boots, you know. And 
spurring on the old horse, you know what I mean? And I thought, ah, oh, that's what it means. But it has a real sense of that incitement. Come on, let's go, let's do it. Yeah, passion. Thank you, Carol. I hope you're getting the passion. And that's what you're meant to do. And we've just come out of Easter only, what, a few weeks ago. And we got a passion to go outside and, 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 and spread the gospel. But we sort of come out of that and go, ah. But we need to keep spurring each other on, inciting each other on, reminding each other of how you are forgiven once. And inciting each other to keep going. Not to give up. Because there's a future when our Jesus will return in glory. 2,000 years ago, I'm sure Jesus would have loved a more enthusiastic amen. He's going to return in glory. So because that is happening, because that's going to happen, you need to spur each other on. Not just for yourself, you know, your little saved people, but because of those out there as well. And maybe for some of us in here. So you're now going to get that opportunity for the next seven minutes. You're going to live in the reality. Who can say now that their mind is starting to get round the fact that they are forgiven once and all done and dusted? I'm hoping there's a number of hands. Your head's starting to get round it. Okay, for Carol, it's round. She's done and dusted, she's sorted. The feelings are catching up. Right. You're forgiven. But you might need to tell somebody next door to you. You might need to incite them to understand that it's all done and dusted. And maybe that person next to you knows that God is calling them to do something this, this week and they need some encouragement in that. But you need to spur. And I like the English term. I'm going to stick with the cowboy boot thing. Yeah, no, that's not a bad analogy because I don't like the idea of spurring animals. But you need to incite. It says in Leviticus, iron sharpens iron. For men, that's a real thing. So you're all equal. You need to sharpen each other up. Incite each other. Get each other excited. So you're going to do that. So could you please stand? Now, find someone. Not your partner. If you are here with a partner of yours, you know, i.e. married or girlfriend, boyfriend, not with them. Go and find somebody else and go and spur them on. First thing you've got to do is say you are forgiven and mean it. Don't make a joke about it because the person who might be receiving that thinks, oh, no, still not me. You need to remind them and spur them on. Spur them on to love and good deeds. If the person you come across has not fully committed their life to Christ, try and ask the Spirit to help you to help them to understand that they are forgiven if they come to know him and it's an easy journey. Go. Don't leave somebody standing. Don't just gaze at each other. Find someone. Even the cameramen, the cameramen could do with somebody next to them. Don't ignore them, please. And now stay with your person that you've got. Stay with them. Pray with them. Spur them on. Don't make it quiet. Make it real. Incite them. And if you talked about something you're doing this week, promise to pray for them and pray for them. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Getting our heads around it at times is difficult to know why. Why would you love me? Why would you love us? But you do. 
and that sacrifice was once for all. Father, it's once for all that is next to my sister and brother right now who are next to me. I want to pray your blessings upon them. I want you to pray, Lord, that they will get this sunk into their minds and eventually their feelings will catch up. Lord, as members of your household, as we're all members of your household, Lord, we ask that help us to continue to incite each other on to love and good deeds, to do the things that you are calling us to do no matter what. And help us show each other that love, not just to return back to our individual, but to recognize we are together. Through your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. And the three words are, once for all. God bless you. Have a great week. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.